डियर स्टूडेंट्स एट द आउटसेट लेट मी वेलकम यू ऑल टू द यू जी सी ई पाठशाला प्रोजेक्ट आई एम आफ्ताब आलम प्रोफेसर ऑफ इंटरनेशनल रिलेशन एट अलीगढ़ मुस्लिम यूनिवर्सिटी अलीगढ़ दिस मॉड्यूल बिल ऑफर अ कम्प्रहेंसिव इंट्रोडक्शन टू द प्रोटेक्शन ऑफ माइनॉरिटी राइट्स अंडर इंटरनेशनल लॉ it will explore and critically assess international legal norms for the protection of minorities it will also provide an introduction to conceptual and theoretical issues like definitional dilemma and justifications of minority rights under international law it will primarily focus on the content of minority rights recognized under international law students there is hardly any country in the world that does not have minorities within their territories characterized by their ethnic religious or linguistic identity different from that of the majority population although there is no accurate statistics the un estimates suggest that 10 to 20% of the world population belong to minority groups in most cases minorities are among the most disadvantaged groups in society and their members are often subjected to injustice and economic and social discrimination their exclusion from power is often combined with the denial of dignity identities and culture they are also excluded from meaningful participation in public and political life even in this modern age cases of genocide targeting minorities are also reported although protection of minorities has been one of the oldest concerns of international law but the need of their protection has perhaps never been as urgent as it is in our time friends the first issue that will be addressed in this module is to understand the very concept of minority in international law a general understanding of the term minority must precede any discussion on the content of minority rights as it is full of complexities and controversies surprisingly until the present day despite various attempts made in the past there is no generally agreed definition of the term minority in international law there are also no settled criteria for determining a minority this situation has arisen due to a number of factors there are strong conceptual differences and states often hold extremely politicized and uncompromising standpoints the difficulty is also because of its inherent ambiguous nature it is often claimed that each and every individual in one form or other belongs to a minority the failure to arrive at a consensus definition of the term minority certainly impinges on the substantive rights of minorities states attempting to deny minorities their rights often take advantage of definitional difficulties the lack of definition gives states an excuse to refuse the existence of minorities in their own territories in many cases this is also problematical from the point of view of law since it raises fundamental question about to whom the convention applies one cannot certainly accord rights to the holy nebulous concepts interestingly however the absence of a general definition of the term minority has not much weighed down the standard setting process within the united nation or at the european level in view of the legal significance numerous attempts have been made over the years at different international forums to clarify the essence of the term minority one of the first official attempts to define term minority was undertaken by the permanent court of international justice in its advisory opinion in connection with the immigration of greco bulgarian communities the definition by the pcij that is permanent court of international justice refers minority in the context of a community as a group of persons living in a given country or locality having a race religion language and traditions of their own and united by the identity of such race religion language and traditions in a sentiment of solidarity with a view to preserving their traditions maintaining their own form of worship securing the instruction and upbringing of their children 
in accordance with the spirit and traditions of the race and mutually assisting one another. The PCIJ definition employs two tests to determine minority status. The first, the objective test that is the existence of facts like race, religion, language and tradition. Second, the subjective test, the sentiment of solidarity and the desire to preserve traditions. The PCIJ elaboration of the term minority did not contain a single reference to numerical factor, a requirement of non-dominance or a nationality requirement. The most extensively cited definition of minority is probably that proposed by Francis Capitorti, who had carried out the even most prestigious study on the question of minority. He defined minority as a group which is numerically inferior to the rest of population of a state and in a non-dominant position, whose members possess ethnic, religious or linguistic characteristics which differ from those of the rest of the population and who, if only implicitly, maintain a sense of solidarity directed towards preserving their culture, traditions, religion or language. Another important attempts were made by Julius Desanche, who defined minority as a group of citizens of a state constituting a numerical minority and in a non-dominant position in that state, endowed with ethnic, religious or linguistic characteristics, which differ from those of the majority of the population, having a sense of solidarity with another, motivated, if only implicitly, by a collective will to survive and whose aim is to achieve equality with the majority in fact and law. There was nothing novel in the definition of minorities provided by Desanche. In the absence of a clearly formulated definition, however, one can still deduce certain objective and subjective elements for a possible agreed definition based on different definitions proposed by academia and international organizations as most of definitions have common components. Nonetheless, some of these characteristics are not without any controversy, indicating our inability to arrive at a consensus definition. There seems to be general agreement about the requirement of a numerical inferior position, political non-dominance, ethnic, religious or linguistic characteristics, which are different from the rest of the population and the collective desire to preserve their distinct identity. These elements certainly help clarifying the essence of the concept of minority in international law. After this brief introduction about the concept of minority, we will talk about another important question as to why minority groups be accorded special rights under international law. It is a matter of fact that in most multi-ethnic societies, the majority communities tend to enjoy inherently dominant socio-economic and political position in comparison to that of the minorities, who are often excluded from the decision-making processes and power centers, endangering their collective identity and rights of their members. The non-dominant and inferior status of minorities renders them subject to discrimination at different stages by both state and private actors. The oppression and persecution of minorities are also reported in some situations. In multi-ethnic societies, according to a philosopher Kimlika, states face a choice of pursuing either integration or accommodation while dealing with the question of minority rights. This leaves the choice of either encouraging assimilation of minority groups to the mainstream culture or allowing minority groups to preserve their distinctiveness through separate institutions. It is widely acknowledged that policy of accommodation can help preserve distinct identity of minorities. The policy of assimilation will destroy the identity and culture of minorities, leading to their exclusion from the mainstream. Pursuant to the policy of accommodation, the need of a legal framework is always emphasized to protect the distinct identities of minority groups. It is because of their vulnerability in any given society 
minority groups always need special status and protection to ensure that they also enjoy the same rights and protection as enjoyed by the majority. It is in the light of these facts, a consensus has arrived both at international and national levels that minority groups need special rights and protections to save them from oppression, persecution and forceful assimilation. In some situations, special affirmative actions are also needed in their favor to achieve the real and substantial equality in the society. In minority school in Albania case, the Permanent Court of International Justice insisted on the notion of equality in fact and held that there would be no true equality between a majority and a minority if the latter were provided of its own institutions and were consequently compelled to renounce that which constitutes the very essence of its being a minority. The PCIJ in the same case stated that minority rights fall beyond purely anti-discrimination objectives. Rather, they especially aim at preserving the characteristics which distinguish the minority from the majority, satisfying the ensuing special needs. Now I will briefly talk about the development of minority rights under international law. The protection of minorities under international law is relatively new. Although its origin can be traced back in the 17th century, reforms regarding protection of religious minorities. One of the early attempts at protecting minorities was the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia, wherein state parties agreed to respect the rights of certain, of course not all, religious minorities within their jurisdiction. The Congress of Vienna of 1815 also dealt with the rights of minorities to some extent. The 1876 Treaty of Berlin also recognized the traditional rights and liberties of religious minority community of Mount Athos in Greece. In, in addition, the first Bulgarian constitution of 1879 contained safeguards for its Greek and Turkish minorities. The minority protection system developed by the League of Nations through peace treaties adopted at the end of the First World War was the first remarkable, systematic and comprehensive attempt to offer legal protection to minorities at international level. The League of Nations system created legally binding obligations through a set of international treaties formulating rules for minority protection enforced by the League Council and adjudicated by the Permanent Court of International Justice. The League system was certainly a bold and innovative experiment but was far from being perfect. It had significant limitations and weaknesses. Its scope embraced only the states on which the peace treaties imposed obligations. Further, the system primarily directed at achieving peace rather affording protection to minorities per se. The system was discriminatory as main powers like Germany, Italy, despite considerable number of minorities within their jurisdiction, did not undertake any commitment to grant same rights to their minorities. Despite numerous shortcomings, of course, the merits in League of Nations system continue to provide inspiration even today. The United Nations succeeded the League of Nations as a new world organization immediately after the World War II. Unlike its predecessor, however, it took a completely different approach to the issue of minority rights. For a long time since its creation, the United Nations showed, if at all, little interest either to adopt the minority protection system of the League or to develop a new system of its own for the protection of minorities. The United Nations preferred to develop a universal system of protection of human rights for all. It was argued that a broad system of human rights supported by strong prohibition on discrimination based on race, ethnicity, language or religion would be suffice to protect the legitimate interests of minorities and no special measures for them would be required. Hence, neither the UN Charter nor the Universal Declaration of Human Rights did make any reference to minority rights. Nonetheless, 
Continuous efforts were made by some states to bring the issue of the protection of minorities on the main agenda of the United Nations. The 1948 UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide seemed to be only exception of the post-World War II trend of subsuming minority rights within the broader framework of human rights. Genocide Convention was directed against the destruction of national, racial, ethnic and religious groups as such and accordingly guaranteed the most basic group right, the right to physical existence. Though the Genocide Convention did not directly mention minorities, they clearly stood to benefit from it. The post-Cold War upsurge of ethnic conflicts in Europe and other parts of the globe sadly validated this claim. The UN, however, later realized that further measures were needed in order to better protect persons belonging to minorities from discrimination and to promote their identity. This slight change in the UN approach was witnessed when the United Nations Commission on Human Rights decided to establish a subcommission on prevention of discrimination and protection of minorities. Although initial efforts of the subcommission relating to minority protection were in fact rebuffed by the commission itself. Until mid-1970s, the subcommission could not address the issue of minorities in some depth, when it finally succeeded in getting a provision on minority protection inserted in the draft of International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is popularly known as ICCPR, which finally became its Article 27. Later, in 1978, its special reporter Francisco Captorti completed the most seminal study on minorities and the subcommission also recommended adoption of a declaration on the rights of minorities. The major even breakthrough, however, was the insertion of the Article 27 in the ICCPR. This is regarded as the first norm that has universalized the concept of minority rights. Today, in international law, Article 27 of the ICCPR is the most widely acknowledged provision affording protection to minorities, which states, in those states in which ethnic, religious or linguistic minorities exist, persons belonging to such minorities shall not be denied the right in community with the other members of their group to enjoy their own culture, to profess and practice their own religion or to use their own language. It was however not until 1980s and early 90s with the end of the Cold War and with the number of highly visible and violent ethnic conflicts and with the potential for more violence that the United Nations and other international organizations started paying more serious attention to the fate of minorities. A strong move towards developing comprehensive minority rights regimes was clearly noticed. It was during this time that the United Nations Declaration on Minorities was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in 1992. The declaration is the first instrument exclusively addressing minority rights at international level. The renewed interest of the international community in the field of minority rights resulted into adoption of a surprising number of international and regional, especially European declarations, resolutions, reports and studies, and even treaties designed to further strengthen the legal protection of minorities. The European institutions like the Council of Europe and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe have done remarkable work in the field of minority protection in the recent past. The Council of Europe's Framework Convention for the Protection of Minorities of 1994 is of particular significance in the evolution of the international protection of minority rights. It is not only the first but also so far the only multilateral treaty explicitly addressing minority rights in greater detail and corresponding state obligations with a monitoring system. These European advancements strongly influence the development of minority rights even at the international level. 
Friends, I will now discuss core contents of minority rights recognized under international law, which include the right to physical existence, the right to enjoy one's own culture, the right to profess and practice religion, and the right to use one's own language. Let me start with the right to physical existence. As it is considered paramount to all other rights, the right to existence of minorities was first recognized in the 1948 Genocide Convention, which prohibits the physical or biological destruction of national, ethnic, religious or racial group. The convention formally recognized the right of minority groups to exist as a group by outlying such destruction. The right to existence here is viewed in terms of protection against genocide. Though no direct reference to minorities is found in the text of the Genocide Convention, they are natural beneficiary of it. It is in this context the convention is considered as an integral part of minority rights. The adoption of the 1992 UN Declaration on the Rights of Minority was yet another important development explicitly recognizing the right to existence of minorities. The declaration obliges the states to protect the existence and identity of minorities within their respective territories. The linkage of existence with identity in the declaration is considered a positive development as it will expand the meaning of existence also to include a cultural existence. Although the Genocide Convention speaks of physical and biological genocide, it does not recognize cultural genocide. The International Law Commission has also made it clear that in genocide the destruction in question is that of material destruction of a group, either by physical or by biological means. The International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia also expressed its inability to include cultural genocide under genocide. The trial chamber, however, recognize that very often physical and biological attacks are accompanied by destruction of culture and religious property and symbols of the targeted groups. In an effort to obliterate all evidence of that group's identity, the court also recognized that acts of cultural destruction should be weighed as heavily as the physical and biological acts in determining genocide. Now I will talk about the rights of minorities to enjoy their own culture. The second important rights recognized under international law. The reference to cultural right is found in almost all international human rights instruments, in at least some of their aspects. For example, UDHR states that everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community. The same has been also recognized in Article 15 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. It provides that steps are to be taken by states to promote the preservation, the development and the diffusion of science and culture. More specifically, Article 27 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights recognizes the rights of people belonging to minorities to enjoy their own culture. The UN Minority Declaration also proclaims more positive cultural rights by obliging states to create favorable conditions for the development of minority cultures. Based on the interpretations of the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the right to take part in cultural life generally entails three things. Firstly, it enshrines the right to engage in one's own cultural practices and to express oneself in the language of one's choice. It also includes the right to seek and develop cultural knowledge and expressions and to share them with others. Secondly, right to know and understand his or her own culture and that of others through education and information and to receive quality education and training with due regards for cultural identity. The use of cultural resources such as language, institutions and land, water, biodiversity and also the enjoyment of benefits from the cultural heritage are also included therein. Thirdly, 
it entails the right to be involved in creating the spiritual, material, intellectual and emotional expressions of the community. This also includes the right to take part in the development of the community to which a person belongs. In addition to different aspects of cultural rights enumerated above, the right to education is also considered as an important requirement for the true and effective enjoyment of cultural rights. This right is particularly vital for the preservation of the identity of distinct cultural groups. The Convention Against Discrimination in Education in Article 5 recognizes to the members of national minorities the right to carry on their own educational activities which not only include the right to the maintenance of the schools but also use of or instruction in their mother tongue as well. Similarly, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights in its general comment on right to education emphasizes on securing a culturally appropriate education, especially for minorities and indigenous peoples. The cultural rights of minorities are not absolute and may not be legitimately exercised in any manner or to an extent inconsistent with other human rights recognized by the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Generally, cultural practices which are inconsistent with national laws and contrary to the international standards are excluded from the ambit of cultural rights of minorities. The participation in any activity which is detrimental to the sovereignty and security of the country is also not permissible. Thus, minority rights mainly aims at protecting minority groups from cultural assimilation into the dominant cultures and securing minimum conditions required for the preservation of the cultural identity of minorities. Let me now throw some lights on the rights of minorities to profess and practice their religion. The contemporary response to religious intolerance and persecution has mainly been in recognizing democratic principles of religious freedom, granting every individual citizen the right to adopt his or her own religious beliefs without fear of government and neutrality of governments on religious issues. The Universal Declaration of the Human Rights in Article 18 recognizes that everyone shall have the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. This right generally include the freedom to change his religion or belief and freedom either alone or in community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship and observance. Similarly, Article 18 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights also guarantees the same rights listed in Article 18 of the UDHR. It however further adds the right of parents to ensure the religious and moral education for their children in conformity with their own convictions. Although International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights does not explicitly refer to the right to change one's religion, experts interpret the provision as fully recognizing the same as proclaimed by the UDHR. Article 27 in the specific context of minorities protects their member from being denied the right to profess and practice their own religion. Moreover, for the purpose of the covenant, the religion is interpreted in broader sense so as to encompass both theistic and non-theistic religions as well as rare and virtually unknown faiths. For all practical purposes, the religious rights set forth in Article 27 for minorities has probably been subsumed into the similar guarantees included in the covenant and other human rights instruments. The 1981 UN Declaration on the Elimination of All Forms of Intolerance and of Discrimination Based on Religion or Belief provides a comprehensive catalogue of religious rights in its Article 6, which include the right to have a religion or belief of his choice and manifest the same in worship, observance, practice and teaching. To worship or assemble in connection with the religion or and to establish and maintain places for these purposes. 
to make, acquire and use to an educate extent the necessary articles and materials related to the rights or customs of a religion or belief. To write, issue and disseminate relevant publications in these areas. To teach a religion or belief in places suitable for these purposes. To observe days of rest and to celebrate holidays and ceremonies in accordance with the precepts of one's own religion or belief. And to establish and maintain communications with individuals and communities in matters of religion and belief at the national and international levels. The 1981 declaration reflects our general understanding on religious rights. In the end, I will discuss linguistic rights of minorities. A major aspect of minority rights has been the right of minority groups to use their own language. In many states, they speak languages different from that of the dominant group and often face difficulties in using the language in public sphere. In this regard, Article 27 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is of great importance. It provides that individuals belonging to a linguistic minority may use their language amongst themselves and that the state must not seek to restrict their affairs because of their status as a linguistic minority. For instance, minorities are allowed to maintain their schools imparting instruction in their own languages, although a government is not obliged to financially support such schools. More explicit provisions on linguistic minorities are contained in the 1992 even declaration on minorities. It encourages states to adopt appropriate legislative and other measures to protect and promote the linguistic identity of minorities. For example, Article 4 obliges the states to create favorable conditions to enable persons belonging to minorities not only to express their characteristics but also develop their culture, language, religion, tradition and customs. It further provides that the state should take appropriate measures so that wherever possible persons belonging to minorities have educate opportunities to learn their mother tongue or to have instruction in their mother tongue. It also obliges states to promote the learning about history, tradition, language and culture of the minorities. The European instruments specify linguistic rights of minorities in greater details and significantly raise the standards of protection, particularly in areas where international instruments are extremely deficient. At the first international legal instrument devoted to the protection of minority language, the 1992 European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages has impressive achievements. The charter covers the provisions relating to use of minority languages in education and in media, in legal and administrative contexts, in economic and social life, for cultural activities and in trans-frontier exchanges. The 1995 European Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities also sets forth a number of significant principles relating to protection of linguistic minorities. It recognizes the right of individuals belonging to a linguistic minority to use their language amongst themselves in private as well as in public. It also acknowledges the importance of the use of minority languages before public authorities. It also contains provisions regarding the right to use one's personal names in the minority language and the right to official recognition of them in accordance with their legal system. It further adds the right to display minority language signs, inscriptions and other information of a private nature visible to the public. It also obliges states to display traditional local names, street names and other topographical indications intended for the public also in the minority language, especially in areas traditionally inhabited by minorities. It also contains provisions regarding teaching of the minority language itself and other subjects in that language without prejudice to the learning or teaching in the official language. And the right to set up 
and manage their own independent educational and training institutions without any financial obligation on the part of the states. Let me now conclude the talk. The presence of one or more minority groups in almost all state is a reality of modern time. It is neither imperative nor possible for every state to be ethnically, religiously and linguistically pure. It is also a stark fact that minorities have suffered discrimination, deprivation and forced assimilation. It is in the light of these facts a consensus has arrived both at international and national levels that minority groups need special rights and protections. It is now clearly recognized that mere observance of equality, rights and prohibition of discrimination may not be sufficient for an adequate protection of minorities and to address their concerns. Therefore, states are required to take special measures to preserve the existence and identity of minorities. Minority rights are also necessary to achieve the goal of substantive equality as opposed to the formal or legal equality. Undoubtedly, there are the various international legal instruments explicitly recognizing minority rights. Nevertheless, their efficacy and educacy are often doubted. The principles enumerated in various minority rights instruments are for the most part not only very general but also subject to multiple interpretations. Implementation mechanisms are also very weak. Minority rights provisions are mostly couched in rather vague language, leaving state parties a considerable amount of discretion in interpretation and implementation. The reluctance to recognize minority groups as holder of rights further weaken the situation. The international community has made significant strides in articulating minority rights. What is now required is to ensure that political and legal commitments accepted by states for their minorities are effectively monitored and enforced in good faith. This is also an essential condition for greater stability and peace within and across state borders. Thank you.